We have a $100 donation from Helpery, who says, love this event and watch every year. Good luck to all the runners, and shout out to my wonderful fiance, Lauren, who makes watching this even more fun. Also, who's that cool guy on the mic, Winky Face? Well, my name is Extra Toppings, and I'm a little worried that you don't know who I am, considering I'm the best man in your wedding, Helpery. Blank Sal donates $100 and says, I love you. This donation also goes to Bare Necessities for the Kingdom Hearts 2 songs. Speaking of incentives, fun incentives we have coming up for Kingdom Hearts 2 later is you can choose a song to be sung. There's Mulan 2, or Mulan, I'll Make a Man Out of You, is currently in the lead. There are also level one fights you can donate towards. There's the level one Sephiroth fight, which is about $5,000 away from meeting its goal, and the level one Lingering Will fight, which is just under 5,000 away. If you donate to those, you'll get some great level one fights. Allison L. donates $25 and says, SGDQ makes going into work way too hard. Well, hopefully you can watch while you work. Neil 100 donated $50 and says, after watching GDQs for the past few years, I'm delighted to be able to make my first ever donation. While one of my favorite childhood games is desecrated by one of my favorite runners. It's so humbling to see what a force for good the gaming community can be when we work together. Thanks to everyone involved for all their hard work this week and Doctors Without Borders for saving lives. Speaking of which, save the animals. Brian Allgaier donates $50 and says, thanks for doing this. It's great to see Ratchet and Clank played for such a great cause and in a way we never would have imagined when we made the game 15 years ago. What an impressive speed run. Congrats. Fuzzy Pickles donated $150 and says, Greetings all. This is my fifth year of GDQs and watching these games destroyed so masterfully never gets old. Donation goes to getting all 32 photos during the Earthbound run. Congratulations and good luck to all runners, and thank you for volunteering your time for such a great cause. Gotta go fast. Kanye West donated $150 and says, I may forget where I put the remote sometimes, but I've never forgotten where all the gold bolts are. As an update on the save versus kill the animals, kill the animals is currently ahead by $997.73. So for only $997.74, you can put save the animals in the lead. Get donating if you want those animals to live. T. Steina donated $50 and said, here is $50 for singing Nessun Dorma in front of 125,000 viewers. Donation goes to Singer's Choice. The Singer's Choice was, of course, the level one lingering will fight in Kingdom Hearts 2. Gary187 donated $25 and says, I have been enjoying AGDQ and SGDQ for a couple of years now. Now I finally have some money to donate. Good luck to all the runners, and thank you for the great times. And thank you, Gary, for your donation.
Coming up next is Jack2 Any% percent with Sikinar, which is going to be an amazing run, so stay tuned. T-Biz donated $50 and says, donated earlier this year to Doctors Without Borders outside of GDQ and donating again now. The war-torn areas Doctors Without Borders serve need our help. Shaxpert donated $50 and says, nicely done on the Ratchet and Clank run and the opera epilogue. Here's a donation for those golden bolts and those golden pipes. Dara Nillen donates $50 and says, that performance of Nessun Dorma was fantastic. Love watching everyone show off their talents, speedrunning and otherwise, at these events. Woody7 donated $50 and says, amazing singing. Way to show off those pipes, Zem. Already donated twice, but couldn't help from donating again. Great run and great voice. Jingo Django donated $250 and says, love what you guys do and just wanted to give what I could. Thanks for being rad. Thank you, Jingo Django, for being rad as well. Jackie Singer donates $100 and says, super hyped for the Shadow of the Colossus run coming up soon. I'm watching while I work and it'll be the perfect way to round out the day. Glad that I can finally donate and participate along with everyone. Let's see that Kingdom Hearts 2 level 1 Sephiroth fight. After Jack 2 is when that Shadow of the Colossus run will be. After that, there will be Marathon Infinity. And we've got a wonderful day stacked up for you today, so be sure to stay tuned all day long. Atlan donates $50 and says, thanks for this event. Thanks for this donation, Atlan. Flotmeister donates $25 and says, save the poor creatures. Toaster106 donates $10 and says, Hey, Sicky, your friend Toaster here. Good luck on your run, and especially on crew skip. After this, how about that Mirror World run? Donation goes to Runner's Choice. Tehip hello and bless RNG in the chat. Lance Charlson donates $20 and says, Beautiful singing back there. Ten out of 10. All right, and now we have Jack to any percent with Sikinar. Okay, um, I, I don't know when we're good to, okay, cool. Okay, cool, so this is Jack 2. I'm gonna be doing any percent. I'm gonna be starting from a fresh file here, so I'm just gonna delete this, and then I'm gonna count down from three, and then you can hit the timer. So I'm just gonna start here. It's gonna start making a fresh save file. I'm using a memory card for this, um, just in case I have to reset and re-enter. Um, gonna start by watching a cutscene. I'm gonna skip it, and I'm gonna go three, two, one, go. Okay. So this is the beginning of the game. Uh, it's much more reminiscent of the first one than any other part of the game, because it's very like parkour heavy. Um, there's about a minute's worth of just really straightforward rolling and jumping. I'm going to probably not talk right now just because this part is really input heavy. There's going to be a thing called a boosted, which is a cool little trick here. I'm going to wait for the cycle here. That wasn't a great RNG cycle, but that's what I wanted to do. That just kind of saves like five seconds because there's like a little um, roundabout that, because of the way the physics works, uh, punching and uppercutting is like really broken in this game. And we're gonna exploit that a lot more later too. Yeah, um, the gist of this game is that it's the sequel of the second, or the first one, and it is a lot darker. It's kind of like 
a gritty reboot kind of thing, which as a kid, I thought that was like the coolest thing ever. I, you know, just go from like happy running and jumping to like you'll see right now. Uh, there's like cars, it's like this crazy city, it's all the future. Um, so that's Escape. You want that to be about under a minute if you can. My personal best is like 58 seconds. Uh, I'm gonna go for a little thing here. Oh, I, okay, I didn't get it. This weird little high jump. Um, but this is Dark Jack. This is like what they introduced in the second game. You're this super overpowered um, version of yourself. We only get to use it here, unfortunately, so kind of just kind of take it all in right now. Um, he's pretty cool. Uh, right now, I'm looking for a vehicle, specifically this one. It's a zoomer. That was really good uh, kind of uh, random spawn chance there. You want to get a zoomer as early as possible. This game is really like GTA style, where it, there's like a mini map, there's uh, waypoints, and we're just going to go from one to the other. Although, in the first like seven minutes of the game, uh, we're going to break this game pretty hard. Um, kind of in the theme of this marathon, you'll notice walls are really uh, vague in terms of collision and uh, where they suggest we go. Right from the get-go, I'm going to skip two barriers. That's the red barrier. So naturally, we call this red barrier skip. I'm um, going to do that. And we can bypass it like that. That skips like a pretty much like a huge part of like the requirements to unlock it because you have to like earn the, your pass to this part of the city. Again, we're going to do yellow barrier skip, which is the same concept. We don't actually see the yellow barrier, but it's there. Uh, same thing. Walls end about halfway up because they figure, you know, you know there's not really a way to get up there, uh, but there totally is. So. This is probably the best zoomer RNG I've ever, like, you could ask for. There's three points where you need a good one to spawn. I got all three to spawn immediately. You can do some camera tricking to get it to do that. Um, it's pretty minimal, though. Usually there's one within, like, 50 feet. Okay, and this is, we call this Mars Tomb Skip. So Mars Tomb is this big secret place in the game. You're not supposed to find out about about two-thirds of the way into the game, uh, which is right inside of this little area behind the statue. Um, using some well-timed jumps, we can just enter it like within the first five minutes of the game, and this brings us to about 60% completion, according to our save file. Uh, I'm gonna do a reset warp here because it's just faster to take the elevator. And yeah, so we're in like an all missions run. This would be about two hours into the game, but in any percent, it's right at the start. This door won't open normally, so we have to clip through it. Uh, that's no problem for Jack because, uh, like I said, most of walls is gonna end halfway up. And if you thought we were done breaking the game, we're not. I'm going to do some kind of weird little precise roll jumps here to climb. Oh, dude, nice. That setup was, I got like an immediate setup there, which is really rare um, from that first jump. Uh, like you just saw, the, the pillars are hollow. You just kind of do a weird little spin thing, and you can climb all the way up to the top. After that, uh, there's these two like trials, like tests of strength that you have to do, which are these left and right tombs. Um, we're going to solve both, or we're, we're going to get through both um, unconventionally. There's a really precise roll jump here. Okay, I got it. Um, that just brings us to this part of this tomb, which is the end after all these like little uh, parkour puzzles. This is the only time we get to control Daxter. Well, not really, actually. This is the only time we get to do like parkour as Daxter. There's this cool chase scene. And what we thought was a boulder here is actually a big spider egg. I'm not going to skip cutscenes very fast through this because uh, the game sometimes will get confused if you skip cutscenes too fast and it has a, the chance to kind of freeze up on itself. Um, we still really don't know why it works, but you'll, you'll get to see the first like two or three seconds of every cutscene because of that. It's also why I'm using a memory card. This part has rubber banding. Um, I want to punch as fast as I can because he's going to keep up with me. Uh, up until right here, and now the rubber banding is pretty much over. I can take this as slow as I want, but I'm still going to go for some two web swag here, as in, or not two web, one web. I skipped the second one there. Shout out to Splitcase Robin, who gets on me every time I miss that uh, little skip. And yeah, just to show you, I can just do this. I can just dance around. You see the spider behind me, um, and then I can trigger that. I have this little guide here that I'm going to use for the next puzzle. It's a set of Tombstone patterns. Oh, and also, by the way, now we have the jet board. It's completely broken. It is like the bread and butter of the speedrun, because we can do that. We can just fly through the air. Um, this, is, this, is, this thing called the hover was discovered a couple years ago. 
And it completely changed the way any percent worked because we can just, walls that were otherwise, you know, impossible to get over are now 100% like, we can do whatever we want. We can go wherever we want, um, only through the limitations of like checkpoints and loading zones. Okay, that was the second best pattern I could have gotten, but then I reset it. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm listening for a certain melody. And now that I know the melody, I can look at this piece of paper and know uh, exactly what I have to do to match all these Tombstone songs up. They each have a, as an assigned melody, and it's sort of like a matching game. We all know how these work. Although there's only six preset ones, so this seems really hard, and it's like, oh, how could you ever you know, get this within a, a few hits? Um, there's only six of them, and luckily, after we get that first song, we know exactly what we're doing. Uh, we have to hit these both of these buttons. Luckily, with the hover, we can just go straight across to the other one. You can do that hoverless, but the hover just makes it a lot easier. I'm going to wait for the game to save here before I can reset. This reset um, just lets us get to the boss fight of the tomb faster instead of having to walk down there. It's this guy named Baron Praxis. He's this dude. He's um, really mean. He's trying to kind of stop you from thwarting his plans to uh, basically control the city as like, you know, the, the supreme ruler and stuff. This is the most RNG heavy segment of the run, which is nice because it's within the first set, like eight or seven minutes. Um, a good practice time during a PB attempt is like 8.20 um, to, to beat him. I don't know what this is on pace on for, but yeah, uh, it's not a big deal regardless. You, the RNG comes in um, with stuff like these spawns. You can actually get a quick cycle here instead of having him shoot twice if you can kill them fast enough, but it's totally dependent on where they spawn. And then also this phase, I'm going to try to hit him five times instead of four. Um, look at the health bar. You can only hold four health here, but it's going to roll over to the next phase, which just makes the third phase way easier because that's where all the randomness happens. Where he shoots the bombs is going to be random. Okay, got it. Okay, so it kind of went up there again to the top, but now when I get a next hit, you're going to see it's going to be at half health. And that's just because, look, these bombs can literally go anywhere. Um... That was, let's see if I can get a hit here. Ooh, no, okay. So like I said, you just kind of have to adapt to what happens. He's gonna shoot another uh, single bomb here. And look, he's at half health, which is just nice. From here, we just have to wait. If he tries to shoot in that gap, he'll insta-shoot, nice, which is what he did there. You kind of want to manipulate him. So that was actually a really good practice. I had one extra cycle in the last phase, but that's totally fine. Um, so yeah, that's like the end of Act 2, basically, I think. And now, uh, something I didn't really address is why I have the jet board suddenly when like there was no indication that I collected it. I also have three of the four required weapons uh, to get through the game because the way this game works, also hovering is usually faster than taking elevators, so I just do that, um, is that the game, like when you watch cutscenes and do certain events, the game checks and says, okay, you're 60% of the way through the game. There's no reason you shouldn't have these, these items. So I'm just going to update your inventory and give it to you, which is really cool for Naughty Dog to do that because um, it just lets us just get, you know, get going right away. Something that the hover um, likes to, or makes possible here is death abuse. Uh, because basically the world is surrounded by a big empty void. So if we can access that void by doing something like hovering over a wall, we can um, just spawn where the game sets our spawn point, which is usually closer to where we're going. Like that. That saves about five seconds. And those are all throughout the run. We're still finding those, like, literally everywhere. Um, to this day, there's just crazy new death warps. There was one I found here recently, which actually ended up being slower, but it looks pretty cool. Um, and so it's just all the active runners are just always experimenting, seeing what we can do. And uh, this is just some basic movement to a checkpoint to activate a mission. I kind of wanted to do a quick roll call here because I don't. I think I forgot to do that um, on the couch. Uh, if you guys wanted to introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Kransoon. I'm Wed C517. Uh, I'm new. Yeah, um, Wed and uh, New are, are also pretty familiar with the Jack series, really good runners, and Kransoon's a, a buddy of mine from a 2D Zelda speedrunning days. So, but I can hover at least. Yeah, Kransoon can actually hover really well. I was showing him how to do this earlier. Okay, so that was a blind hover. It was kind of tricky. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I count my hovers there because this is kind of blind. 
But once you do it uh, like a hundred times, you get used to it. Um, I'm gonna do a swag little clip here. Um, oh no, okay, I didn't get the clip. That's okay. Because at least that actually could have ended really bad. If you get the setup for that, but then you like fall back down, you can actually crash the game. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a little close. It sounds like a common trend. Yeah, this that's welcome to Jack speed running. Well, Jack 2 speed running. Um, the game will just kind of do what it wants. Uh, I'm gonna try to, my best to provide con like narrative context because it seems really random like why I'm doing all these things. Um, usually when I hit these waypoints on the map, there's gonna be a cutscene. I'm just gonna skip it because this game lets us skip every single cutscene. Um, so yeah, if it seems confusing, I'll fill in the blanks there. This is the, probably the biggest like overworld hover. This one saves about seven seconds just going over this wall. You can see on the mini map what I'd have to do otherwise, go around this like little bend. It's worth noting that Crimson Guard spawns in the city are random, and when you touch a Crimson Guard with the jet board, you'll both take damage, get knocked off your jet board, and then aggro the guards. Uh, and sometimes when I'm falling there, and I'm doing, kind of doing that blind fall, I'll just like hit a guard that just like spawns, like, like, you know, bullseye right on top of him, and it's like, thanks, game. This is also the longest loading screen in the game. Um, I think it takes about 10 seconds. And welcome to the escort mission of the game. It's semi-auto scroller with two really big RNG portions, and also three of the best supporting characters in the entire franchise, in my opinion. It's Jinx, Mog, and then the other guy. Um, <laughs> I don't know his name. Yeah, he's, the he, he's the guy for this game, <laughs> as Zen was saying about Ratchet and Clank. So I need to activate uh, like certain text or speak triggers with Jinx early on so that it doesn't waste time later. Um, this is an ambush. A scripted ambush. There's three spawn points for these spiders. They could be like literally anywhere. I want them both to be on this side, because then I can just jump and spin. Both spawn over there, so that's not cool. Uh, I don't want to take any extra damage, so I'm gonna be. I'm gonna play my cards safe here. Um, so when you're spinning around like that, does that do extra damage with the gun or anything like that? It doesn't do extra damage, but what it does is it auto-homes in on enemies and then makes the, the, the fire rate really fast, which is really good. It's kind of an oversight of the way spinning and shooting works in this game. We're going to abuse that a lot, especially for like the last boss fight. Like you saw there, I did a spin and he just homed in on those people at the end, or those little spiders. That was good because if you kill those two fast enough, these two behind me don't spawn and I don't have to backtrack. Um, you saw that these two were just kind of chilling up there. They're always there, even though it's a scripted spawn. So even though they're supposed to fall on a certain point, you can just bam and shoot them. These two, however, don't. You'll see them like insta-spawn. Um, and you actually can't... Um, this level is weird. There's kind of like a radius around the three supporting characters that you can't go past or else... Uh, the mission will end automatically because it'll be like, oh, you abandoned your friends, dude. So um, you always want to stay within a certain range of these of these dudes. I could have gone over, and those those spiders are like there, but you just can't access them because otherwise the mission will end. And actually, there's like a lot of downtime here. I'm just waiting for these dudes to catch up with me. Um, so if you want to just do some resend donations, I'll be doing swag covers. Of course, Vazer donates fifty dollars and says, "Hey, Sicky." Hope you're enjoying the marathon and that your run goes well, which I'm sure it will. Just gotta send it. <laughs> Thanks, Vazer. Vazer is like one of the, the more OG members of the community. He's found a ton of cool strats and comparisons. His research into this game has been invaluable. So yeah, shout out to him. We have a $5 donation that says, Hey, Siki, it's your buddy Sloa. Just wanted to donate to ask if you remembered how to jump. At least tell you remember how to roll. Good luck with the run. You're going to do great. Money goes to runner's choice. What is your choice? We'll find out later. When so this out. fight, the way the, the spider spawn is not necessarily random. Um, sometimes it seems like they give you extra waves depending on what you do or how you move, which is kind of unfortunate. I really just want to micromanage their, the Jinx's health and all of them. Sometimes they can actually get um, take too much damage in the mission will end. That was actually really good. Um, I'm going to check my yellow ammo. I have 122, which is really good. That means technically I have enough for the next big kind of like ammo heavy mission, and I don't have to go out of my way to get more ammo. I probably will just to be safe. Um, let me see if I can land on this guy's head. Nice. 
Look at that gem. OK, so instead of leaving, I'm just going to spam the pause here and do a reset warp. Reset warps are really common, especially like throughout the city. You'll see me kind of chain them together when spawn points will change. But I can explain that later. Um, right now, we're tasked with um, hunting down these three big spider robots and destroying them before they get to the rebel base. So I'm going to start a cutscene, and then I'm going to go ahead and make my way over to fight them. And that's where I'm referring to the ammo count. I'm going to use about 100 yellow ammo for this next fight. Ooh, look at that yellow. That Crimson Guard was a little too close. Shout out to Crimson Guard hitboxes, which are really vague and not really like reflective of where they are like physically. The this area, it's like the little hideout. I visit here a lot, um, just because this is sort of like a central hub of a lot of the the story activity. So I noticed for that section, you didn't uh, try to grab a zoomer like you did before. What's the movement speed of the hoverboard versus zoomers? Yeah, so um, two side flips with the jet board brings you to max speed, um, which matches a zoomer speed. Uh, for the most part, if you're comfortable jet boarding around the city, you're better off doing that for um, certain like shorter distances because you don't have to worry about zoomer spawn RNG, you don't have to worry about um, crashing it or anything like that. Oh, what a trolley guard. Okay, that's good. Okay, so... Um, but yeah, like I was saying, yeah, and also the animation to get in zoomers takes a while, so um, you're generally better off just kind of, you know, hopping on your board and going. These these guys don't have iframes, so you can get these insanely quick kills. I think casually, you're supposed to kind of like hover around them, try to dodge their lasers, and you know, shoot them down. The the physical uh, body of the bomb bot doesn't have any sort of like hitbox to deal damage, so you can just kind of get stuck under them and then like. Spin your spin and shoot, which every frame you're going to be dealing damage. It looks it's kind of counterintuitive, but the melee attacks are what are doing most of the heavy lifting in these fights. Here's a cool little time save hover. There's a ton of these. Just like people will be like, oh, you can just like hover over, you know, this wall or this wall. You just see those all the time. Okay, that was actually really good. Also, this is the one spot I'm going to want to zoom or spawn. So that was really lucky. And the reason I want to zoom respawn here is because the canal district, which is this area that we do visit a lot, is not like flat ground. It's just a bunch of rivers. And getting from A to B on a jetboard is actually suboptimal for the most part. Um, so we're just going to hop in one of these. I'm getting really, I think I've had basically perfect zoom respawn RNG here. Driving is a little important because you have to be conscious of avoiding both pedestrians and um, vehicles. It's kind of part of like learning the game is getting uh, consistent with driving. Kind of just like real life. Yeah, exactly. Also, shout outs to Collision, or the lack thereof. That is totally free. You can try that at home. That corner is just kind of have a big hole in it when you're, when you're on a vehicle. Shout outs to Donkey Kong 64. Yeah, yeah. We thought that game had no collision. This one kind of... Uh, Gives it, a, gives it a run for its money, I should say. This is the first of uh, three races. So I'm going to explain how this race works, and then after the next few laps, you can just read donations, because it's going to be the same thing, more or less. Um, I'm just going to do uh, this little lap skip. There's a different lap skip I'm going to do for laps two through four, because when you're not being bombarded by NPCs, you can kind of play a little riskier. But for now, um, that's about what this uh, lap looks like. Uh, yeah, so we'll have downtime here. We have a $10 donation from William Hanna, William Hanna, that says, Hello from New Zealand. Got up at 3 a.m. to watch and donate during this run. Jack and Daxter defined my gaming childhood, and seeing it run at GDQ fills my heart with nostalgia. Good luck to Sikinar, and thank you to Doctors Without Borders. Donation goes to Caster's Choice. Jay Pals donates $20 and says, Excited to see one of my favorite games, Jack 2, get wrecked on SGDQ. Keep up the good work and let's keep those donations coming. P.S. Kill all the animals. So I'll just mention really quick, on lap 5, I might start lapping the NPCs. If I do that, that could cause problems. So I'm going to have to adapt to what they do. Um, so it's, yeah, just there's a lot of um, uh, decision making you have to make kind of at the end here. Rexy donates $20 and says, Good luck to Sikinar on the Jack 2 run. 
It's my fave PS2 game of all time, and it'll be so amazing to see how he'd break it. As Baron Praxis would say, sacrifice for your city. And most importantly, sacrifice for those frames. Donation goes to Sikinar's Choice. So like you saw there at the end, um, I was being kind of crowded by NPCs. You have to kind of learn to weave through them. They can steal your boosts, they can crash into walls and blow up, and then thereby blowing you up. They're huge trolls. They, I've lost some really fantastic runs to just kind of um, stuff out of, that you can't really do anything about. Okay, I'm going to try to hover up to this car. Nice. Okay, so uh, that one, yet again, really good zoom response. Canal District, just kind of want to you know, jump in one as soon as possible. Um, we're going to do a series of um, reset warps here. Uh, this game is just like a big jigsaw puzzle of loading zones, um, which actually is why um, one of the first thoughts a lot of people have when they see the, the, the hover is like, why are you even driving? Why are you, you know, running around the city when you can just hover over all these walls to the end of the level? And trust me, I wish we could do that. Um, but when you don't, when you're not low enough to the ground, you can't cross certain um, uh, checkpoints, and that actually causes areas to not even load. So you have to kind of cross them manually um, to actually let yourself get to other parts of the game. So here I had to cross a checkpoint there, and then now I'm in this part of the city. Also, uh, sick grind, bro, as Zorlax says whenever I do that. So yet again, another restart warp. I'm actually going to do this series twice. Because now we're just kind of closer to the port, which is where we're going here to pick up a, a rather OP weapon. Uh, the weapon's called the Peacemaker, and it's featured in this one and then in the um, Jack 3 as well. Uh, in casually, it's really awesome. You can just like, it has like an area of effect thing, and you can chain its um, attacks to multiple enemies at once. In the speedrun, it's slow. It, um, it has not a lot of ammo. You say I only have five out of ten ammo. You can get uh, ammo increases later, but um, overall, it's just not really relevant to the speedrun except for a couple boss fights. It's worth mentioning that in terms of ammo routing, uh, runners will, will use the Peacemaker ammo differently depending on where they want to use it. Um, they all kind of balance out in terms of time save at the end. But uh, the first two races are like almost back to back. I'm just going to hop into Zoomer and start racing this dude here named Errol who, um, if you play this one or Jack 3, you're pretty familiar with. He doesn't like you because you're kind of like, you know, the new hotshot around town. You came out of a portal from Jack 1, and suddenly you're just like, you know, everyone is looking to you for help, and he feels kind of like, uh, you know, left by the wayside. So he's going to race you to prove that he's better than you. But as you can see, we're already, like, really far away from him. Um, that being said, the, his NPC, like his like uh, model, can actually cheat and just go through walls um, arbitrarily if he's too far behind. That's the game's form of like extreme rubber banding. It's just like, well, uh, if you can't beat him, join him and just glitch the game out. So um, these rings give you boosts, but they also are part of the gimmick of this race. You have to cross through them um, in sequence, or else uh, the mission will instantly lose. So these lovely pedestrians around me, who I'm going to try my best to avoid. Um, both because you know I have no beef with them, and also they might be solid and have collision, which I don't know until I hit them, uh, can send me flying in any random direction and can just cause me to just miss rings, which are out of my control. Uh, nice, cool. I had like basically no solid people there. Um, a really good arrow race can get in the low 150s. Um, if you chose to do ringless, which actually is like an alternate route that takes like a different area and skips rings, can get like 148, um, which is pretty impressive. Uh, it's not RTA viable uh, as of now, but um, you can exploit the hop here. You can hear him do little hops like. Uh, like that, um, which make turns a lot sharper. It's kind of the one of the main mechanics of the races, at least, to hit a lot of these sharp turns. That was really good. I think it's going to be like a 157. Yeah, nice. Wow. So. so generally for the races, is like a sub two minute time pretty much really good for all three of them? Yeah, the cool thing about this game is that all the races are really similar in length. Um, they're all around two minutes. If you can get sub two in all of them, you're, that's really good. 
Um, it's sub two is a little more free for Errol. Um, the other two, it's like 158 is like it's like really good. Basically gold, like you're tying your golds. Uh, this next mission here, I'm gonna go to Dead Town, which is like the old Sandover village from the first game, but it's been run down and you know attacked by these metalhead creatures. And I'm gonna visit Samos's hut, but I can access the end of the level much quicker with the um, jet board, and because of the fact that one wall in particular doesn't have external collision. So don't be alarmed. But I'm just gonna like do this, and then I'm gonna just do a front flip into this void where a cutscene trigger is. It looks pretty neat. So there's that wall, uh, GG. And then, trust me, it's there. Yeah, okay. Sometimes I'll miss it in runs, and you'll just kind of see him tumble down, and you'll just question everything about your life. <laughs> um, um, I'm also not gonna leave through the airlock that I went through. I'm gonna do a thing called Ghost Town, like that. And I'm just gonna hover over this wall, and you're gonna see what that is and why I call it Ghost Town. Um, I'm going to pass the camera through the door to actually trigger uh, this area to load, but now I'm in the city, I didn't have to wait for the airlock, and there's no minimap, there's no people, there's nothing. This makes jetboarding really free, um, because you don't have to worry about hitting solid people or uh, vehicles or what have you, and also it just saves time because you don't have to wait for the door to open. Another little time save there. Something to be said is that when you're learning this game at first, um, I always encourage runners to keep trying, even though the hover might seem like a really hard trick at first. It's kind of like the gatekeeper of this game is consistently hovering. Um, all I can say is, like, you'll get it eventually if you just keep practicing. Um, this trick here is another really cool hover, which we actually can't really do when there's people loaded into this area because there's just so much lag. And the, oh, oh no, I lagged. That's totally chill, actually. <laughs> Let's go around. This is the alternate route. Um, but what lag does is it drops inputs, and this um, this trick is really, really vulnerable to dropped inputs. You really have to keep a rhythm. It's not about matching speed. It's about, um, like, a rhythm. So that was Onan, and that was her hut. She's cool. Um, yet again, going to do some more death abuse by hovering over these walls. It's worth noting that um, a lot of these death abuses actually can just be done via reset warps, but they're faster just because taking a death means shorter time to wait because you don't have to enter the menu, you don't have to, you know, cycle through all the, the options to do reset mission and stuff. Um, there's always sort of like a mission flag, so you can always reset mission, quote unquote, even if you're not on an active mission, and we're going to actually exploit that later to do some fast traveling. I'm glad I didn't hit that dude. If you hit Crimson Guard vehicles with a jet board, it like does phase two of the guard aggro, which is actually like both foot soldiers and vehicles, and they're all using their ammunition on you, which um, can really end a lot of runs because you'll either die or just it's slow. Um, this is Haven Forest. This is like my favorite area as a kid because it's like, it's kind of like throwback to the first one. You still have these cool temple-like stuff. There's a lot of parkour here. But um, this is another super auto scrollery part. I'm going to be doing some ammo farming here, but that's the most technical thing about this fight. So um, you can just read some more donations. We have a $50 donation from DTAT who says, had to donate during Jack 2, one of my favorite games as a kid, but I always thought it was stupid hard. Here's to seeing dozens of hours of adolescent gaming frustration wiped away by this incredible speedrunner. We have $15 from Bouncy Brown Bear who says, Jack 2 is one of my favorite childhood games and seeing it get decimated is amazing. I'm laughing so hard. Chodo the Bright gives $5 and says, Hi, Siki. Wanted to wish you the best of luck, and I know you're going to do awesome on this run. Always proud of you. Nothing but love and respect. Cup of Joe. Love, Chodo. Shout out to Chodo the Bright. He's like one of my OG friends from uh, Speedrun community. He's a really cool dude. And um, just in, hey, by extension, shout outs to, um, we're in a Discord called The Fleet City. It's just a bunch of like buds I've known for years. Uh, so shout outs to them. Kevin54 donates $150 and says, Is Jack 2 the best game at SGDQ this year? Maybe not. But is it the most formative for my childhood? Most definitely. Put this towards singing Friend Like Me during Kingdom Hearts 2. Anonymous donates $50 and says, Good luck, sick Noor, you got this, my friend. Many exclamation points. Hip, hip, hip. <laughs> 
I know who that was. So, um, just gonna update my status on the speed run here. So, what what's happening basically is um, I, that that ammo that just dropped, I'm manipulating the drop tables to get that. Um, I want five to max out my peacemaker ammo. This will be five. So now I can just spam the yellow. The reason you can't use guns here really is because that is the lowest priority munition drop. Um, and the game says like you need yellow first. Like don't worry about peacemaker. So I'm trying to tell the game like I'm good on pe I'm good on yellow. Just give me the what I want. Also, this part is not random. These things, uh, all these guards spawn in a very certain order. I know where these dudes are going to spawn. And these are the real, the flying dudes are what really matter here. Um, you want to kill them as fast as possible because they're like, if you delay their spawns, then you'll just sort of keep delaying the spawn of every successive one. And that just makes the mission a lot slower. Yeah, it's almost like the uh, flying enemies are on a cycle because sometimes they will go underneath and you can't really hit them from below the wall. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you let them get away from you after they initially spawn, they'll, they'll just um, you know, run around and do their own thing. And usually it involves you being in an area you can't shoot them and you have to like find them and that's just like absolutely tragic. I'm going to do a second ghost town trick here after a little tactical reset warp. It's funny, if you can hear your PS2, you can hear the game doing this, like, the scratch scratch of like loading, and right when you hear that, you can reset warp whenever you want. That one's a little more free. You just have to make sure you count out the right number of hovers there. And now we're back in the city. There's sort of an aesthetic model of the city, and you have to fall in a very specific area to get like the physical version of it to load, just the way the camera works. Um, I have to hover uh, over this one in a particular way to get that to load. And then now I'm going to store a mission here. Mission storage is not really used a lot, but it's used for one very specific um, shortcut, which saves about 50 seconds. And it's a, it's, yeah, so it's a, it's a huge deal. Um, it's also kind of an advanced strat because, um, well, not to make it sound like it's hard, but um, I'm going to take that zoomer because I didn't see any other spawns. Um, you, you see, I have this mission active. I talked to that dude named Brudder, who's a lurker from the first game, but he's like sentient and he can talk. And I'm gonna help out his uh, lurker buddies who have been trapped in, um, by the Crimson Guards. But I'm gonna leave that for now, and I'm gonna go do some side missions that are, that are relevant to the plot anyways that I need to do. But this time, instead of going there and then back, I'm gonna go there, do a reset warp to, oh, okay, to restart the um, lurker mission, and then, thank you to spawn there. And then from there, um, it's basically like a fast travel. You don't have to drive back if you just delay doing this mission. Um, but the thing that happens is if you die during these two missions, it overwrites that mission flag. And um, you, you do end up having to do the drive, which we call, um, in a joking way, the drive of shame. Um, for a marathon, I'll just call it the scenic route if I end up having to do it. Uh, I'll do some cool jet boarding swag and stuff if, if it comes to that. But um, let me do a little trick here. You can ride the jetboard in there if you do your inputs in a very particular way. Um, sort of like in Ratchet and Clank, this game is from that same era. The beginning of the end of levels is kind of usually at the end. Uh, in this case, it's just right above you. So look, we can just arbitrarily fly up in the air and trigger a cutscene. And boom. Um, my split name when I do attempts of that is called Destroy Eggs, and you never watch the cutscenes or anything, so people are always like, like, what does that even mean? And basically what you're doing is you're dropping this big, like, uh, uh, storage unit on top of these, um, metalhead eggs. Um, just so you know, so you're not kind of thrown off there. Uh, this is another really long loading zone. Um, this is Drill Platform, the second of the two missions I can't die on. You see that door? Uh, casually, you're supposed to blow up that door. But um, we do this because it's completely free. And uh, there's this invisible wall there that only stops about halfway. I guess the developers figured, like, they get, they'll get the idea. They'll hit the wall at the kind of the, the upper part, and they'll know, like, just don't go that way. But um, if you push your luck, you can just keep going down and then make it through. Uh, we, we, we're going to have to re-enter the, the playable area, unfortunately, right here um, and continue on with the Titan suit because we do need, we, we actually do need the Titan suit, the, the Big Mac thing, to finish the level. 
Um, we're working on a way to skip using it. We just need to blow up these computer terminals using it, which um, kind of start the second half of this level. Okay, let's see. I'm going to take that slow because uh, I don't want to die. Okay. So, yeah, um, we need to... Similarly, the only reason I'm doing that and hitting these switches is because I just need to get the Titan suit from here to there. Um, if, if we figure out a way to skip the Titan suit, we could either probably just hover straight to the end of the level or just not hit those switches and just, like, forget about it. Um, and you'll see why. Uh, health management here is a non-issue. You see I'm at full health here. I'm going to get through a big, like, kind of metalhead ambush fight later. Um, but I can tank most of the hits because... Um, Casually, you're supposed to already have gone through like half the level. Also, if you stand on the edge of these platforms, the fire can't touch you because the hitbox is really thin for the fire. Um, fun little trick. Um, but yeah, so hopefully these metalheads play nice. This is kind of a big reset point because if we get bombarded by metalheads here, it'll just make this whole part slower um, because the punches aim bot on not the computers but the metalheads because the game thinks it's helping you. So watch, it's gonna probably snap to one of these dudes. Um, if he jumps off like that, and I just miss the terminal. That's why you want to kill these dudes as soon as you can. Oy vey. Okay, come on. Okay, so uh, that, this is an example of kind of what not, what you don't, what you don't want to happen. Oh, I was supposed to do a double punch there. Nice, okay. So I'm at half health. I can still keep tanking probably. If they jump on you, then um, you don't aimbot to them because um, he kind of forgets about them. When this half of the mission ends, though, the game kind of forgets that you need to worry about the metalhead, so they'll just disappear. <laughs> kind of funny looking. But yeah, so um, that was okay. You just have to learn how to adapt to what they do. If you can manipulate them to jump on you and kind of stay on you longer, you can just start punching the terminals when that's happening. This is the big jetboarding section of the game. This is like the really crazy uh, obstacle course. Um, we're going to try to do this as fast as possible, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so that was okay, actually. Okay. I'm going to take this pretty gingerly because uh, waste, uh, here it's like a um, cost-benefit. Do I, do I want to waste a few seconds, uh, you know, getting off the jet board, or do I want to lose 50 seconds to falling off the edge? It's kind of a pick-your-poison. Um, but yeah, that was really good. Um, I didn't die. That's, that's what I was worrying about. I'm going to go for a tiny little skip here. Skipping that cutscene on a very specific frame, and I got it. Okay, nice. so cool. Yeah, that's called communicator skip. That uh, it's a really cool little time save. Uh, we don't really understand it, but basically, if you skip that cutscene on the right time, uh, no one that little communicator doesn't talk to you, and it costs about five seconds to listen to it. And that was the reset work. And that is now we're back here with Brudder, um, our our buddy, and we're gonna do that lurker mission. So this is um, really sh it, this is a straightforward mission, um, although very variable um, at the same time. We just need we have two we have three pairs of lurkers here. The first one's on a global timer, so I just want to get to them as fast as possible. The other two's like cycles don't start until I enter the loading zones. But yeah, they're really random. They have a mind of their own. They can do whatever the heck they want, including like when you blow up the cars, they can just fly over the walls and into the void and end the mission for you. Um, so it's not fun to lose runs to stuff out of your control. This is one of the main areas that that can occur. I'm going to try to manipulate this to get him to fall closer to this vent, because now I don't even have to pick him up. I just have to do this, and you'll see he'll kind of look for me to the vent. That means he's aggroed on the vent instead of me. Luckily, the game prioritizes that, so um, when you drive away, he'll just hop into the vent, and you'll see the counter go down to four, or it already did. Um, here's a funny thing. I'm not going to hit the rock. I'm going to hop over it. it hitboxes, really how do they work? What? Hitboxes, how do they work? Yeah, hitboxes. What, what are those about? I don't know. Um, the second set, uh, the cycle kind of starts around now. Um, this one is the easier. Of the, first, the first set's kind of scary. Uh, this one's a little more straightforward. I'm going to do another damage boost on the second one. Just kill this one as fast as possible. I try to shoot the lurker with my gun, 
Hello. Uh, when when I do it, because that stops the lurker's momentum and kind of erases any potential damage momentum from the actual car blowing up. Nice. That was also really good. You, you see he's aggroed on the vent. Now, pair three is scary because we're going to the canal district. And if you remember, this is rivers everywhere. And when a lurker model touches the water, the mission ends automatically. And there's no it's not up for debate. The game just ends the mission. So I'm going to manipulate this one to go into the corner. Also, look, uh, Ration and Clank on the little banner. <laughs> it was going Commando, though. It wasn't the first one. But um, yeah, that's a cool little shout out to the, to the other franchise. Um, I'm going to try to beat out the second one, um, part of its cycle. And I want to interrupt it and kind of force it to drive a different direction than where it tends to. Um, it didn't do that, so I'm going to do this. OK, that was a little sketchy. But that's the backup. You, now you have to lure it over um, from over there instead of having it go all the way around over here. It costs about 7 to 10 seconds. Not the end of the world. I'd rather do this than having it fall into the water. So now that I think it's good, um, the mission ends. You just really have to learn how to adapt to what happens in that mission, um, especially with the last phase. Um, the main rule of thumb is just keep moving, keep going, get in a car, find any car you can, and just Try to finish the level. Here's everyone's favorite wall clip. Because um, we're going to go to the stadium again. We're going to do uh, the last of three races. Oh, I'm glad that didn't blow up. Um, this one is the, the most... Oh, wait. Reset warp. <laughs> this one doesn't just bring us right to it. And now, um, yeah, this is just um, similar to the first race. There's going to be cool lap skips. NPCs are a problem. But other than that, nothing special. So if you just want to read uh, donations, that's totally fine. We have an anonymous $20 donation that says, Jack 2 is the first game I ever bought. It's great to see I wasted hours on those needless first 60% of the game. Travis C. donates $10 and says, This is for my friend who says, Leave the animals alone. Anonymous donates $50 and says, This marathon is keeping me sane. Shout out to my boyfriend Joe who gets to hang out with my cat Friday while I suffer. Speed running and Kingdom Hearts are two things we immediately bonded over, so this donation goes, to, goes towards the lingering will fight. Smokeloak donates $50 and says, Massive props to the runners for their insane amount of patience and dedication. Shout out to everyone behind the scenes as well. Keep up the great work and be sure to slaughter those fuzzy wuzzies. I'll just mention really quick. Um, I'm trying to get double boosts on this first pair here because it just lets me get an extra boost. A boost saves about a second. So, um, and boost routing here is really scripted. I'm going to boost in very specific spots. Yeah, I know I've seen in the uh, in the practice room that uh, if you boost in the wrong spot, the game doesn't the game punishes you pretty hard for it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> because it doesn't take much for you to just blow up against a wall, and in uh, just kind of an auto-scrolling segment like that, that's never fun. Yeah, the the zoomers in the races are incredibly fragile. Uh, that was unfortunate RNG at the end. I got both my boosts stolen there, so I had to just kind of drive this normally. I might have been sub two. Okay, so nice. to give story context, the reason I'm being hunted down by Crimson Guards now is because um, Aerol, that dude, he was actually racing against you in that race, and he lost, of course, because we got first, and he's like, just tired of you, you know, just beating him. So he tries to ram into you with his car. You jump out of the way, and he hits a bunch of dark eco, and supposedly gets, you know, obliterated. Um, or so we know, you know, <laughs> in this part of the story. Um, but yeah, so then the Crimson Guards are like, hey, dude, you're causing a ruckus. And then they start chasing you down. Uh, I got really good RNG. There's a lot of scary RNG at the very beginning of that mission because you're not only being like bombarded by Crimson Guards, but you need to find a vehicle and get out of there as fast as possible. At this point, um, if you want to be optimal, you really just got to hope you get a zoomer, which could either be parked there or it could just be chilling out um, above you driving around. I got a parked one, which is just really lucky. And I'm also not getting aggroed that hard by guards. Sometimes you can just be immobilized by their bullets because they just decide to be really accurate and um, just be really um, shoot a lot more than usual. 
Um, yet again, reset warps. A smaller thing that Siki actually did there when going onto the car was he negated a text box because whenever text box are open, you cannot actually go onto a zoomer. So what he does is he does a quick pause, which you do by pressing select, and quickly unpauses, and it gives you like a quarter of a second to be able to get onto the zoomer. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a really handy piece of speed tech. In that context in particular, that means um, otherwise, like, if you hypothetically didn't know about that, you would have to wait about another six or seven seconds on foot to get in a vehicle, and that's scarier when you're being like shot at. So yeah, it's a lifesaver that we can do that. This is another example of, we're actually gonna, this mission ends in the same elevator that we went in. So what I'm gonna do here is just hover over a wall to that elevator, um, but enter it from the other side, uh, which otherwise we're supposed to go around like a long loop to do this, which the hoverless route here is actually really sick. It's worth, it's worth mentioning that, you know, of course, um, the, hover, the hoverless route used to be the any percent route. Um, it's a really cool speedrun. That's kind of what I saw first when I first started, um, you know, watching speedruns was the hoverless route and then stuff like the hover came about and it just kind of turned the speedrun into like a, a totally different thing. Um, so just, um, it's, I just wanted to mention that the hoverless route is, is still pretty dang cool. <laughs> a funny thing with that skip back there, if you so happen to decide to watch the cutscene in that big room with columns, mm -hmm. you will actually crash your game if you try to do that hover. Yeah. Every time. <laughs> it's yeah, it's literally every time. And um, as when I was a new runner, um, of course, you got to learn that stuff the hard way, <laughs> like I did. I watched the cutscene once, and I was like, ah, oh, no big deal. I'll just hover over it. <laughs> um, this is the longest hover in the game. We're gonna skip the weapons factory. Oh, nice. Okay, that that hover has to be pretty accurate. That was almost as good as you can ask for. Um, you just want to pass through that thing and then load this area. Which instead of doing the actual area, I'm gonna hover for about 15 seconds um, over everything. We pass through one of these rooms, then a red room, and then another blue room, and this is where we have to go. So, but we're not done yet. Um, don't blink, because you're going to miss this. I'm gonna, this is called Robot Skip. I'll explain it after. Solid. Okay, so <laughs> Jack seemed to die for no reason there. What happened was... Um, I loaded a death plane by the elevator, and when I went up to the second story of this level, the game kind of keeps track of what like story you're on, and you know accommodates death planes accordingly. Um, there's a death plane up there that corresponds to the top of the elevator, which we just spawned at. Um, so what we did, we crossed it while hovering, and um, the game said, "Oh, okay, you fell down the top of the elevator, and now we're here." Um, saves about I don't know how much time, maybe 15 or so seconds from fighting the robots, because um, of course the setup takes a while, but ultimately it's still faster. Um, this is the crew fights. This guy is kind of this recurring character who's been employing you to do missions for him so that you can get notoriety around the town, get connections. But it also turns out, lo and behold, the weapons dealer that you know uh, happens to also be, you know, giving weapons to the Baron. Surprise, surprise. So he's not a cool dude. We, we got to do away with him. He takes a fight with you on this tower. And um, the way this fight works is there's three waves. Um, every wave is like little versions of him, or as he likes to say, he says, ah, multiple me's, which I just think is a funny line. Um, or you could just call him Flubber. Yeah, Flubber. Yeah, that's, that's uh, another pet name we have for him. Uh, and then between those phases, you see I'm using that Peacemaker ammo that I tried very hard to, to farm, because I just love using it here. It just makes this fight a lot smoother. Um, it's faster to... to if you use, like, the most opti optimal way to use it, uh, technically, I think, would be during the core fight at the end, core being the, the name of the final boss. Um, it's kind of still not known what the best option is. Um, it's so uh, kind of close that you could either use it here or there. It's preference. Um, that um, runner I mentioned earlier, XT Vazer, this is something that he looks into a lot, uh, that I help him out a little bit, too. Um, but he does most of the heavy lifting when it comes to finding out comparisons for different strats. I almost just fell off the edge there. Um, so just like, if if we can give you the hard numbers on wh which run or which strat is faster and why and how by how much, it's probably because Vazer told us. Um, he has a channel where he just does all these cool comparisons. 
Uh, so that's the end of that fight. Um, we defeat him, and we find out where he's been hiding a really important piece of um, uh, plot, piece of the plot, I suppose. But, um, uh, and that leads us into the most high-octane part of the run, uh, the Metalhead Mash. It is uh, basically whack-a-mole, which we can actually trigger by outside of the, the building without entering it. But yeah, so um, this is fixed, <laughs> fixed rates of uh, the cycles aren't random. It's the same every time. It takes about a minute. Uh, so if you want to read donations, feel free. We have a $30 donation from Anonymous saying, Hello, Siki. It doesn't seem like very long ago that you started this speedrunning thing using a fuzzy CRTV on our apartment living room floor. Now you're on the big projector in glamorous Minnesota. Wowzers. Good luck on the run. It's been a privilege to watch the whole ride. Money goes to runner's choice. Anonymous donates $10 and says, Major props to Sikinar for giving top-tier commentary while destroying one of my favorite games. This is the type of run I hope for each GDQ event. Great job, everyone. As kind of slow-paced as this is, this can actually be pretty nerve-wracking because this part leads into one of the scariest tricks in the game called Underport Skip. I'll just kind of give a brief uh, synopsis of it right now so that I don't have to explain it later. There's not really a lot of time to when, it, when the trick happens. Um, we're going to load um, kind of the lower floor of a level um, outside of an elevator so that we don't have to take the elevator down. And what that does is that actually lets us roam freely around an area that's otherwise submerged underwater. And uh, that lets us just hover straight to the end of it instead of having to get in the Titan suit again, which is uh, uh, like you which is what we used um, in the drill platform level. I'm going to give it a sec here. Uh, this area is notorious for crashing, so I wanted to take that really slow. OK, so the start of this trick involves, uh, the, like the elevator I mentioned is actually um, at the door kind of down there on the bottom right. But I'm going to access it from the inside here so I don't have to go inside of it. This trick is, uh, it's just, uh, it's a big, you have to control the camera in a very specific way. You have to get this area to load in a very specific way. And uh, I did this right. Nice. We loaded this area. Nice. And now um, we're going to pass through the elevator, pass by the elevator again one more time to load the region that we need to get to. Otherwise, it's deloaded. And um, there we go. OK, cool. So that's under port skip. Nice. Yeah, that hover is scary. <laughs> Because if you drop that hover, you lose about 30 seconds. This part is um, also auto-scrollery. Um, th what happens is we need SIG to get to the end of this level, or else we actually can't finish it. The game doesn't acknowledge that the level ended. So we have to kind of do this the, the casual way. We have to solve the puzzles, because um, otherwise he just won't move. Um, so that being said, also a lot of just straightforward movement, if you want to read a few more donations. Sure thing. Fangamer donates $1,500 and says, Hello from Fangamer. Been loving the speedruns and also loving exploring downtown Minneapolis. Thanks for holding SGDQ in this great city again this year. We're breaking up this donation into several chunks to vote for some names in upcoming, ga upcoming games. Go Beefaroni. Meow Mix Mix donates $150 and says, Loved Jack 2 when I was a kid and loved seeing it be broken as an adult. Keep up the great plays and commentary. Okay, so this is kind of the end of this auto scroller level. Um, that part can just be really tricky. I always like try to be a little more careful than I think I need to be because sometimes I'm not paying attention and I'll just fall off the edge. <laughs> and this. Uh, I remember one of the comments earlier back mentioned that they found this game to be really hard as a kid. Uh, so did I. Oh, also, the, the ceiling here doesn't load uh, until you pass a certain point. So you can just look at it, be deloaded, and then there it is. OK, cool. So um, what were they saying? Yeah, so I think, to me, one reason why I think I found this game to be so hard as a kid because there's like no checkpoints inside of missions. So if you like die, you're just kind of like, you're on your own, um, and you have to restart the majority of it. Uh, let's see here. 
Um, and that also in the speedrun makes it a little high intensity because it's like if you die during any of these missions, usually that, that's like a minute or two minutes of time loss because um, you can't just reset you know, a, a segment of it. You have to just go all the way to the beginning. Another thing that tends to be quite brutal is that in casual play, this game hardly gives any ammo. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you'll be, you'll just have to deal with melee everything. Yeah, ammo routing in this is really important um, because I think, unlike in the third one, which tends to be a lot more forgiving, this one, um, the balance is is pretty tilted towards the the end of um, like the more difficult end of the spectrum where you're always kind of fighting to collect more ammo. This is uh, just a big driving portion. We're, we're on the home stretch. Basically what we're doing is um, we need to move this big flying vehicle over to outside of the final boss's little nest, and we're going to use that to um, kind of defeat him. But in order to do that, we need to protect the two sages that are, that are going to be carrying it to um, where it has to go, which is in the stadium. So there's just a lot of straightforward driving. Not a lot of reset warps you can do here, actually, because when you're going this direction, the reset warps tend to be counterintuitive. I'm going to take this a little slow. It's worth noting that the, this game like pushed the PS2 to its like absolute limits. So look at the minimap. Look at all the red dots there. Those are all like independent little models that it's creating. Um, the Naughty Dog team like totally just like went ham with this game, and it's it really goes to show how much this console was able to do. I think there's still things about this game that I think were a generation like like too early, like just so many of the cool concepts they did. Um, I'm going to rely on red ammo at the start here. I'm going to use blue and red for this. I don't want to dip into my yellow because you notice it's, it's full and I'm, because I'm going to use all of my yellow ammo for the final fight. So I just want to have that full. I don't want to worry about it. Um, for now though, yeah, these spawns aren't random. Uh, for the most part, they spawn from the same locations with, with, with uh, slight variance, you know, to some degree. Like the, the exact coordinates they spawn are not the exact same, but you kind of get an idea where they're coming from. Um, specifically these frogs that are going to jump down here, they could spawn like, like, they could just jump on top of the sages and ruin your day because every time the sages gets hit, that's like one and a half seconds of them like stopping and getting staggered. So that's not cool. Um, I still don't know if hitting this makes it any faster. I'm like 100% sure it doesn't, but it feels like it's going faster. So I do it because I'm usually nervous here. You can get infinite jumps off the bottom of this thing. It kind of looks funny. That's actually a piece of cool speed tech in the third game, but you, don't, you never need to do it here but you can, you can right there. Um, I'm going to probably switch to red soon when they all start funneling in from behind me. But for now, it's OK. No, back up. This is going to be a no-hit Samos, I think, which is going to be sick because uh, it doesn't happen all that often. At this point, it's pretty free. You just do this. Here and spam the red, and then when it lands on that those balloon platform things, the mission's gonna end. So that's a thing. Okay, so then now. Oh my god, that's made me nervous. <laughs> the, usually that void loads in earlier. That's the closest I've ever gotten to the void. <laughs> I thought I was gonna fall off. I've never actually had that happen. Um, it startles you though at first, but you usually don't have to worry about it. Don't do that, jerk. These NPCs are knocking me around. Um, so, um, as you, I don't know if you heard from that communicator, uh, Vin, one of your uh, supporting characters, he's been overrun by metalheads, but he just told us that uh, where to go. The Baron is hiding at the construction site, and that's where he's getting ready to arm his like super weapon. We're gonna go get to the bottom of this. Uh, the construction site is an area that uh, I have a theory was maybe meant to be a little more lush with activity and more missions, but they just sort of put it on hold because there's already so much in the game. Because um, if you look, you can examine the, the construction site area and you can see how much detail was put into it and how big it is, simply just to go inside of it once and watch a cutscene. It seems a little wasted. Um, but, you know, this game is hardly lacking in content, so... This is also one of the last, like, really scary parts because you can crash into a construction site. Yeah, the thing worth noting is that 
during this phase of the game, we can't aggro the guards because they're preoccupied with all the metalheads that have invaded the city. And that being said, there's about three times as many models on the map <laughs> as there usually are. So the game sometimes can be s the, you know, the console is like stressing. You can trigger this cutscene without actually going through the door, which is right there. You can just stand here and trigger it because the, the radius is so big. Um, yeah, so I'm going to let the communicator here kind of do some of the talking for the narrative. It's really quick, so you can just listen to it. Um, gives the gist of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Yeah, like I said, I'm going to get to the Metalhead leader. I'm going to stop them from doing their crazy plan to finally take over the city. Um, there's a couple more uh, hovers that can lag because there's, like, lightning here. And this lightning is actually kind of a pain. It can lag this hover, and it's not fun when you're on PB pace. Uh, so I'm going to start a cutscene here, do that. No, don't splat. Okay, good. <laughs> I thought he was going to splat there. Uh, quick little one here. Otherwise, you, instead of doing these hovers, you can actually just do these, like, um, roundabout um, obstacle course regions, which are like pretty fun, but you don't have to do them. Um, this is the core fight. This is the final fight. I'm going to use all my yellow ammo here. This fight looks the same if you do it right every time. And time's coming up on the, after the last phase. Time should be coming up fairly soon. And time. Okay. Barely a 102. Was that, was that seriously a 102? Yeah. Wow. Nice. That beat my, I wanted to get a 104 if I could. So 102 is, is like, I'll take that. Um, yeah, that, I'm really happy with that run. Nothing really went wrong. I got all the big stuff um, in, the, in the game. Uh, so yeah, you saved the day. You defeated Core, and you see this light precursor, dude. But yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to do a shout out to the Jack community. Um, it's really welcoming community. When I first started this game, they all helped me out a ton. We're really uh, welcoming. Shout outs to like uh, Vazer, Boomer, Pickle, uh, uh, the Rixer. Uh, yeah, um, shout outs to this is like all my buds on the couch, wed, new, Cransoon. I, I couldn't be happier with this run. That was great. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> that was Jack to Any Percent run by Sikinok.